everyone needs coaching. If you have a growth mindset, you're wanting to get better, you want to maximize your talent, um, you need people um, correcting you, you need people coaching you up. Players who don't want to be corrected or who have a hard time with it um, usually are not going to maximize their potential. Off-season is, is, I think, a misnomer. You know, that just means we're not playing games. Off-season is incredibly important. You know, I have a, a philosophy that comes from 2 Timothy. It says, be prepared in season and out of season. Absolutely what we should do all the time in football and in life that, you know, off-season is a preparation time. It's not a time just to kick back. Great to see you all today. My name's Justin Graves. I don't know how to work a mic, but I am the pastor here, so you're in good hands. Um, we are glad that you guys are here, um, and I just want to state this. Let's, let's address the elephant in the room. My team stinks, okay? Uh, my team's not good right now. OSU fans, your team's great, okay? It, you don't know how much it pains me to say that, um, but I can be fair and honest and evaluation and balanced. Um, I sound like a Fox News commercial right now. Um, but, uh, hey, I'm here for it. I am, I'm going to be a fan whether my team is great or whether they are bad, right? So um, right now it's not fun to be a Sooner fan, but I'm here for it. And, um, yeah, hey, next week we start a series I'm really excited about. It is called What Not to Do in a Horror Movie. What Not to Do in a Horror Movie. You have to really enunciate that because some of you are like, what? Um, a horror movie, um, and it's going to be, if you missed it, that's okay. Your mind is more pure than your pastor's. But um, don't miss it. It's going to be really fun. It's going to be about a series based on fear. In the last two years, we had a lot of people operating and functioning their whole world out of fear. Um, and so we're just going to dive into this for a series. It's going to be really great. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so don't miss it. But today we're ending our series, Friday Night Lights, um, and we're going to be talking about the off-season. We're going to be talking about the grind. And today, if it's okay with you, um, second service, I'm just going to preach. We'll see what I hit on my notes. We'll see what I don't hit on my notes. Um, so uh, I, just, I just got a lot to say, and I need to get to it. Because here's the deal. You heard uh, these different coaches talking about the off-season isn't fun. You've watched the NFL. Off-season's not fun for NFL. College athletes, the off-season's not fun. It's a grind, right? It's a lot of hard work. Why? Because games aren't anywhere on the map at that point. There are no pep rallies. There are no homecoming dances. It's just a lot of work without a lot of payoff. The payoff comes in the season. So you're working right now for a payoff that's not going to come till months down the road. And can I tell you, sometimes that's the way life is. Right? Sometimes life is just a grind and the off season that we face. I loved what Bill Blankenship said, and we'll get back to it in a second about one of his quotes, but he said, Man, off season's a misnomer, right? Like we misunderstand what it there's really not an off season when it comes to life. And if I can be real honest, there's not an off season when it comes to following Jesus Christ. When it comes to us being followers of him, if we don't own the grind, if we don't own the off-season, man, we're really going to come out of those seasons and those moments with a lot of regrets, right? You've heard this quote. I've heard this quote. It says this, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life, said the dumbest person to ever live, right? That's not true. That's just not true. That's not, and I know what he's saying. Some of you are like, nope, that's how I feel. Just wait. Live a little bit. You're five years old, right? Like, Keep living like you've been there for two weeks. Oh, my job is so great. It, some days there's moments it's just work. I love what I do. I love being the pastor of Foundation Church. I love what I get to do. It is a blast. It's fulfilling. But there's days it's work, right? There's moments your marriage, all the butterflies are gone, and it's work, right? There's days where it's, it's not about making you know, all the emotions and making these huge accomplishments that life is just work. And, and what I want to tell you is that there are, many of us, we love the birth of the dream and we love the fulfillment of the dream. Those are two really fun places to be. Where you see the, the dream accomplished and you see the beginning of a dream. But can I tell you from here to there, it's called the grind. 
It's called the meantime. And most of your life is going to be spent in this meantime moment, in this grinding moment. And how you function in that is how you function in life. And so, so, I want us to come to a text. It's found in Acts chapter 28. And to set it up, here's what's happened. Here's what's going on. The Apostle Paul had just got done being shipwrecked. Um, Why he's on this island, he's gathering some sticks uh, for a fire. He grabs some wood. He gets ready to throw it on the fire. Out of the fire comes a snake and bites him on the hand. I would be like, are you freaking kidding me right now, God? Like, this is it? This is how you're going to treat me? A snake, right? Like, God, turn it around. God, turn it. Like, I would just be busting into that song right now, right? I was singing that yesterday, first half of the OU game. God, turn it around. God, turn it. It didn't work. Um, so, and he's been like, People have tried to kill him. They've had to lower him in a basket. All this stuff has happened, right? And he finally gets to Rome, and he's waiting for a trial to happen that's going to kind of decide what his punishment is for being a Christian and what the Jews are calling that he was totally uh, just committing blasphemy. And, And anyways, so he's under house arrest. Two years in Rome, house arrest. And this is the very end of the book of Acts, Acts 28. Verse 30 through 31, it says, for the next two years, let that sink in. Two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. That doesn't sound so bad, but understand what's going on. He's under house arrest. He has a Roman guard posted outside of his house, and he has to pay to stay there. He has to pay for his own prison. Think of that. You've got the most decorated church planner of all time, one of the greatest apostles, one of the greatest spokesmen for Christianity, stuck in a place he doesn't want to be, awaiting a trial that he didn't deserve, and his, he can't come and go, he can't minister like he wants. So what does he do? In the midst of being in a situation that wasn't fair, in the midst of being in a situation that wasn't what he asked for, in the midst of being in a grind, he writes what we know as the prison epistles. You know them as the book of Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, the book of Philemon, the book of that he, the letters he sent to First and Second Timothy. Not that they were brothers; it's the same guy, just two different letters, right? Um, this is what he did, and all of a sudden, because he didn't, he was in a place he didn't want to be. He did what he could, right? He did what he could, even though it wasn't where he wanted to be. And as a result, the fruit that came out of that ministry, the fruit that came out of that moment, the ministry that came out of that moment has affected millions and millions of lives throughout history. And here's what I have discovered when it comes to the grind, and Paul shows us, is is one of two things is going to happen. We either make progress or we make excuses. We either make progress or we make excuses. This past week, I asked some of our parents to send me excuses that your children have told you that were fantastic. And they... It made my week, right? It's amazing when you make social media fun what happens. And so um, I want to read you a few of the things that came in. Amy O'Neill said this. She said when Brock was little and was supposed to be going to bed, he got up several times, needed a drink, and then needing to use the restroom. You know this story, right? Like You're like, yes, I've been there. The last time, the last straw came, I got firm and said, why are you up again? And his response didn't miss a moment. I just wanted to tell you, you have beautiful eyes. <laughs> she, she said, oh, man, that was good. And he was able to stay up a little bit later. Um, <laughs> man, if you're in trouble, just say, hey, I just wanted to tell you, you have beautiful eyes, babe. Um, Melissa Meyer said this a few weeks ago. Hunter informed me that the reason why he doesn't listen to me when I talk or ask him to do something is because he speaks Spanish, not English now. Um, <laughs> Robin Fisher said, uh, when Cameron was little, we would go grocery shopping at Albertsons. They gave little ice cream cones to the kids, um, and we proceeded the counter to get one, but she refused to say thank you, so I made her give it back. She's a mean mom. Um, as we were walking around the store, I asked her why she didn't use her manners, and through her tears, she replied, because I left them at home, Right? Some of you, you need to use that excuse because you never take your manners. Maybe some of you don't take them to home. But anyways, 
That's a different message. Faith Hall said this. This is, this is one of my favorites. Bo, Bodie, her son, magically becomes allergic to food he doesn't want to eat. Can't pick up things because his muscles are sore from exercise. And can't blow his nose because his boogers will think he doesn't like them. Um, here's what I want you to know. We, we, we are born with the ability to make excuses, but we have to really try to make progress. Right? This is what this shows you. We're born with the ability to come up with creative, great excuses. But in the grind, you're either going to make excuses. The difference between, the difference between you making progress or having regret is are you, going to, are you going to make excuses or are you going to get to work? Right? And some of us, we're so busy making excuses, we're not making any progress. Can you imagine the excuses the Apostle Paul could have come up with? Right? Well, I just can't be creative in this environment. I'm having writer's block, right? This just isn't my vibe. I have a poor Wi-Fi signal. I need a mental health day. There's all sorts of things that he could have said. And the difference between us owning the grind and the grind owning us is really two things. Really two things that I want to charge you with today. If, if you find yourself in the grind, if things aren't fun right now, Right? If, if things are hard, if you feel like you're not making progress, can I tell you, keep going and keep making progress because the goal is this, is that we would become more like him daily, that we would die to ourselves, that we would pick up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow him, not every once in a while, not when we're feeling it, not when it's easy, but daily, that he would become more and I would become less is what John the Baptist said, that he would increase and I would decrease. And if that's going to happen, hear me, this is a charge, this is going to sound mean, this whole sermon's going to sound mean, but if you will listen and you'll let it get in, it will do some work. Here's what I would tell you, you got to keep working hard and stay faithful got to keep working hard, and you got to keep staying faithful. Today, I understand, I'm not talking about salvation today, right? To, salvation, you couldn't earn it, you couldn't disqualify yourself from it, right? Salvation is a gift from Jesus Christ. In fact, we're going to be taking communion, talking about the cross and the sacrifice Jesus made on a cross that was free to us but cost him everything. You can't earn your salvation. You can't earn your way into heaven. It is a gift and it is about a personal relationship with Christ. But today what I am talking about is sanctification, becoming more like him even when it's hard. Becoming more like him even when it doesn't make sense. And if you're going to see progress through the grind, if you're going to own the grind instead of the grind owning you, the off-season, if you're going to own the off-season instead of the off-season owning you, because here's what I see all the time. I see followers of Christ, people that, are, that really have great intentions when they don't feel Jesus anymore, right? When the emotions aren't there, when things get hard, when things happen that they don't understand, they just opt out. Instead of lean in and roll up their sleeves and work hard at still following Jesus, because it's easy to meet him, but it takes effort to follow him. Right? I'm going to keep following Jesus even when I don't understand what's going on, even when it's hard. I'm going to work hard at becoming more like him, and I'm going to keep staying faithful. Bill Blankenship said this, off-season is a preparation time. It's just not a time to kick back. Can I tell you, that's life. Right? Like, we don't put it on cruise control. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4 says this, lazy people want much but get little. Woo! But those who work hard will prosper. Proverbs 14, 23, work brings profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. Can I tell you, some of us, we talk hard, but we work very little. We're great at talking. Some of you are like, but that's what you do for a living. Um, you, you, you're great at talking, but you're bad at working, right? Can I tell you, there is a spiritual aspect of working hard. And we don't talk about it too much because we're in a society that has a word, but it is our culture right now that I hate called entitlement. All right, I am entitled to something. I'm entitled to God doing this for me. And let me stop you there. If God didn't do one more thing for you or me, he's already done way too much. Right? Like you don't deserve what God has already done for you. So stop 
saying, well, God's not fair. God doesn't love me. God doesn't like me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that he that would believe in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. Well, my parent owes me, and I had this, and this isn't fair, and that's not fair. You can sit there and make excuses, or in the middle of your grind, you can roll up your sleeves instead of talking a big game, get to work and stay faithful in the middle of your grind. What's it going to be? What's it going to be? Because some of us, we've gotten better and we spend more time rehearsing our excuses of why everything is happening and why everything is going on than we are getting to work in the areas we're wanting to see God show up in. Some of us are like, well, if it's God's will, I'll stay married. Can I tell you it's God's will? Right? Let's talk this through. But it's also God's will for you to stop being lazy and get to work in your marriage. Some of us, we don't need to just pray about things. We need to work at things. Like there's this balance. You need to pray about things, but you also need to work at things. Like do your part. Well, I just, I need some financial margin. Well, stop spending more than you make, dummy. Like I'm just being honest. I told you it's going to be mean. Can I tell you, you drift into debt, but you got to dig yourself out of it. I've been there. I've been there. Right? I, I, we, you're not alone. So when I'm calling you a dummy, I'm calling myself a dummy. I did dumb stuff too. <clears throat> I don't know why we don't have any financial margins because I had 45 venti lattes a month, right? Like there's a reason. Some of us, we wanted, well, you know, if it's God's will, I'll be free from alcohol and drugs and not be an addict. Can I tell you, he that the sun sets free is free indeed, but you got to work to stay free, Right? Come on, you got to do your part too. Like Jesus set you free, but you got to do some hard work of saying no and going a different direction and doing some work and putting work in. Some of you are like, well, I just don't know if it's God's will. It's God's will, but you got to do some work to this because here's what I find out and here's what happens is that we want faithfulness, but we don't want to pay the price of faithfulness that faithfulness requires. We love the benefit and the significance that faithfulness brings. In fact, I would say this. This is my equation for you. Long-term faithfulness equals significance. Long-term faithfulness equals significance. It says this in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Imagine if that happened. Um, yet, we hear that some of you are living idle lives. Refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. Isn't it amazing when you're not doing what you should, you start engaging in what you shouldn't, right? <clears throat> we command such people. This isn't just a suggestion. Paul is saying, I'm commanding you, right, such people, and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, you brought the Jesus card into this. He sure did to settle down. Settle down. Calm down, right? Calm yourself. Settle down and work to earn their own living. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing what is good. And if we were honest, some of us are tired of doing what's good. Right? We're tired of being faithful because it's, we're not seeing the fruit of it. And I, what I would tell you is stop gauging your faithfulness to a certain month, to a certain year, and just stay faithful and do what you know God's called you to do where you are for as long as he's got you there. We've been, we've been doing Foundation Church for a little over 14 years. I've been a pastor here for almost 15 years. I know that math doesn't add up, right? Because I was working at Foundation Church in December when my family moved here. I was slinging coffee at Starbucks. The dream <laughs> looked nothing like the reality. We set up and tore down for months and years at Memorial High School. The dream looked nothing like reality right now. We were at an old Lutheran church. Thank God for it. But man, it was not the dream, right? We made the best of it. And we grew and we grew and God blessed and he blessed. But it didn't look like the dream. We're right here right now. And can I tell you, there are still things that are unfolding and happening that are 14 years later down the road that are coming about after 14 years of staying faithful. If you will stay faithful, hear me. 
I know faithfulness isn't sexy. I know faithfulness doesn't look good, but we want the fruit that faithfulness yields, the significance of it, but we don't want to pay the price. If you will just be willing to work hard where God has you and be faithful at pursuing the calling and plan that God has for your life, hear me, at a moment there will be a harvest if we don't give up. That's what the Bible says. Man, so own the grind. So what keeps us from owning the grind? What's the difference between us owning the grind and staying faithful and working hard and us not? It's happening right now. It's happening for some of you watching online right now. It's this. You got to be coachable. You got to be coachable. And the question is this today. Are you coachable? Do you listen? Do you follow instructions. Coach Lauren Montgomery said this, you need people coaching you and correcting you. Players who don't like, right, that's where a lot of us are. I don't like it when they talk to me like that. I don't like it when people tell me what to do. I'm a grown man. You still need people telling you what to do as a grown man. Make your bed, right? That players who don't like or have a hard time with it usually aren't going to maximize their potential. And here's what I would tell you. When we aren't coachable, we become hasty Emotional, stubborn, and stupid. It's true. Are you calling me stupid? I sure am. But it's not me, it's the Bible. You'll we'll check it out in just a second when we get there. When we're not co- coachable, we become hasty. And when we become hasty, we become emotional. And when we become emotional, we become really dysfunctional and we become stu- I'm going to keep doing it my way. That's a stupid way to live, right? right? Proverbs 19, verses 2 through 3, one of my favorite Proverbs, says this, Enthusiasm without knowledge is no, is no good. Haste makes mistakes. Everybody say mistakes. Yes, haste makes mistakes. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. Can I tell you, I see Proverbs 19 happen all the time. Oh, man, and it breaks my heart. People start making hasty decisions and emotional decisions, and here becomes the excuse of why they're, because when we're not coachable, we're always excusing the reason we're not coachable, right? And and here's what we say, well, my situation's different. Well, you just wouldn't understand, Justin, right? Well, I don't have time to make that, to, 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 I don't have time to make the right decision. I just got to go with my gut, when you say you're going with your gut, that means you're going with your emotions. Let's just call it the way it is. And, and hear me. If, if time is your enemy, then wisdom is not your friend. Let me say that again because it's really good. If time is your enemy, then wisdom is not your friend. It's really hard to make a wise decision when you're not taking the time to get wisdom and understanding and knowledge like the Bible talks about. And what happens is this. We make hasty decisions when it comes to dating. Woo! When it comes to getting married. Still with me? Don't turn me off online. When it comes to our finances. We don't get wisdom. We don't get understanding. We don't listen to people telling us something that we don't want to hear. And Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1 says this, to learn, you must love discipline. It's stupid to hate correction. It, that's the Bible, right? And some of you, what is happening is you are more about what you want to hear than what you need to hear. You're more about what I want to hear. I, I want, if you're not going to tell me what I want to hear, then I don't want to hear it. But what you want to hear is doing you no good. It's just making you more hasty, more emotional, more stubborn, and that's a dumb way to live. Right? And, and here's the warning I will give you. Here's the warning I will give you. Listening to the wrong people will yield the wrong results. Whew. Listening to the wrong people will yield the wrong results. There's a perfect example of this in 2 Chronicles chapter 10. It's the son of that took over for King Solomon. His name is Rehoboam, right? Rehoboam. And Rehoboam follows his dad's uh, uh, 
lineage. He's the next king of all of Israel. And why they are there, why they're going, man, Rehoboam meets with all the leaders of Israel. And they're like, hey, Ray Ray, right? Um, your dad pretty, was pretty strong. Um, he worked us to death. He taxed us to death. And we need a break. We need a breather, right? And so he confides and he seeks the counsel of Solomon's advisors. They're an older group of guys, and they're like, man, I would listen to him, Rehoboam. This would be a good thing for you to do. If you listen to him, they will be your faithful servants forever. Um, but he didn't like what they said, so his new group of advisors were his buddies he grew up with, right? And they said this, nah, nah, don't listen to those old guys. What do they know, right? This is what you tell them. You thought my dad was harsh. Way do you get a load of me, right? Like my dad used to whip you with ropes. I will whip you with scorpion. Sounds like a Will Ferrell line, right? Like, check this out, right? And all of a sudden, you know what they did? They rebelled against him. When Rehoboam sent a guy to come kind of try to get retain order, they killed the guy. And Rehoboam's like, okay, got it. And he lost more than half the kingdom. Why? Because who he listened to yielded the wrong results. And as an athlete, you learn this. You learn that you've got to block out all the noise and listen to your one coach, right? You got to stop listening to mama telling you to shoot it every time you take it down the court. You got to stop listening to your daddy telling you should be QB1 when you're 450 pounds as a left tackle, right? You're not a quarterback, you're a left tackle. But my daddy says, it doesn't matter what your daddy says, you better listen to your coach or you're never going to get in the game. You're never going to be significant if you keep listening to the enemy, to all the chatter, to people that love you but never will tell you the truth about your situation. And some of us, we've got to stop listening to people who always say nice things, and we've got to start tuning into what the Lord is saying to us and playing for an audience of one. So what do you listen to? Let me give you three things. The first thing is this, the Word of God, the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. There you go. It's for you. Can I tell you, it is there. It is a guide. It is a how-to to your life. And the, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit's never going to contradict the Word of God. Right? If your friends, if your buddies, if your great-great-grandma, your mamma, right, tells you something that's not biblical, don't listen to her. <gasps> I know. Second thing is this. Listen to the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. Most of the time, He doesn't scream in your ear. He whispers in your ear. We're great at praying, but are you great at listening? Are you taking time to be silent and listen? Most of the time we complain about God never talking to us, but we never open our Bibles. Right? There's a reason. There's a direct correlation. And the, second, the third thing I would say is listen to people who are producing fruitful and living fruitful lives. You know what I've noticed in churches? People are great about talking about fruit, but very few are great about producing fruit. There's a difference. Just because they have knowledge of the word doesn't mean they're living the word out in their life. And find you some people. Man, I've got people in my life who I love what they are producing in their life. And I'm like, hey, come on. If you see me getting a little bit off, come talk to me. Now, they may talk to me about my long hair right now, but I'm like, hey, you know, like, let, let, talk to me because I don't want to get off and I respect the fruit that you are bearing in your life. Are you coachable? Because here's what I, here's the encouraging thing. When we're coachable, we're humble, we listen, we follow, and as a result, we become wise. Man, when we're coachable, we're humble. We realize we don't have all the answers. And when you realize you don't have all the answers, you listen to the Word of God. You listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. You listen to other people. And it's not just that you listen, you actually follow the instruction that's in the Word of God. It's not just that we need more information, we need more application so that there can be more transformation, right? And you start following what those godly people are telling you. And all of a sudden, here's the result of that. Your result is you're considered to live your life out in a wise way. Right? Here's what I'm going to encourage you with today. I want you to find your Jethro. I want you to find your Jethro. In Exodus chapter 18, there's a story of Moses. Everybody remembers the story of Moses. Moses, can we just establish this, is the man. 
at this moment, at this time. He is the man that God appeared to in a burning bush and started talking to, right? He is the man that God used to send the ten plagues um, to, to the Egyptians. He is the man that led the Israelites away from the Egyptians. He is the man that, that raised his staff and the Red Sea parted. Remember Ten Commandments, right? Like, he is the man that had the Ten Commandments given to him and, like, came down on, the, on Mount Sinai and threw them and, like, the earth opened up. And anyways, he's the man. And all of a sudden, he is meeting with all the Israelites, and he's hearing everybody's problems. It's called pastoral counseling. And so, like, Moses is doing pastoral counseling from sunup to sundown. Um, he's hearing, every, they stole my camel. They stole my donkey, right? They're doing this. They're doing that. Blah, 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 blah. And he's worn out. The Israelites are worn out. It's happening day in, day out. And Jethro, his father-in-law, of all people, men, think of this. Jethro, his father-in-law, shows up, chapter 18, and he says this, this is not good. <laughs> How would you take that? Do you know who I am? I'm Mo. I am the big Mo. I am Moses, right? And Jethro, I want you to think of this. Moses was 80 years old when he went back to Egypt. How old's Jethro? Like, there should be a silver alert out for Jethro right now. Like, why you left your tent, Jethro. Nobody asked you, Jethro. Right? This is, and he shows up and he said, this ain't good. Like, you big dummy. This is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. You're going to wear yourself out and the people too. The job's too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now listen to me. And let me give you a word of advice and may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representatives before God bringing their disputes to him. And he gives them some more information. And it says this in verse 24, Moses listened to his father-in-law's advice and followed his suggestion. Why was Moses so dynamic in being used? One of the reasons was he was coachable. Right? He was humble. In fact, Moses wrote this about himself, that he was the most humble man to ever live. I don't know what kind of contradiction that is. I am the most humble man to preach, right? Like, like, but he was humble, and he was. If you're going to listen to your father-in-law that's 100 years old, you're humble. He's humble, and as a result, he listened, and as a result of listening, he followed their advice, and he was considered wise the rest of his life. Now hear me. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to know all the answers. Stop putting that pressure on yourself. You don't have to know what to do in every situation. That's why the Word of God is there. That's why you have the Holy Spirit as your guide and your counselor. That's why you need to surround yourself. Right now, I've surrounded myself with godly men that are just a teeny, wee, teeny bit older than I am. That are, that are just, just got finished with the stage that I'm at. And I'm like, hey, what would you do here? Hey, what, what would be your advice here? Because I know I don't have to have all the answer. And when they tell me something I don't like... I pray about it, and I, man, I listen, and most of the time, I would say most of the time, I follow it, because I know they're telling me what I need to hear, not necessarily what I want to hear, and can I tell you what it has done? It has saved me from making mistake after mistake, living with regret, and saying, man, I wish I could have a redo here. It's not fun sometimes. Can I tell you, life's not fun. The grind's not fun. Sometimes it's tiring. Sometimes it's exhausting. And today, if you're here and you want to give up, today, if you're here and the grind is owning you instead of you owning the grind, let me leave you with the scripture that is found in Proverbs. Well, excuse me, Hebrews. I've got to skip through all of my Proverbs verses right now. I've got tons of Bible, but I don't have time for it right now. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 5 through 6, and then 11 through 13 says this, and have you forgot the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he love, loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So, I love this part. So, take a new grip with your tired hands. 
and strengthen your weak knees and mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. The great thing about Moses following the advice is that it didn't just affect Moses' life, it affected his family's life and a whole nation. Can I tell you, when you decide to stay coachable, when you decide to be humble and listen and follow, it affects everybody else's life around you. Proverbs chapter 2. 15 says this, plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. If you listen to constructive criticism, you will be at home among the wise. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourselves. But if you listen to correction, you will grow in understanding. Proverbs 10, 17, people who accept discipline are on the pathway to life. But those who ignore correction will go astray. Proverbs 13, 10, pride leads to conflict. Those who take advice are wise. Proverbs 19.20, get all the advice and all the instruction you can so you will be wise the rest of your life. Can I tell you, you may be weary, you may be tired, you may be tired of the grind. Don't give up. Stay coachable. Take a grip with your weary hand and your weakened knees and make a path, mark a path straight out. This is what I know God is calling me to. This is his word. His word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It hasn't changed, so I'm going to keep following him and I'm going to make sure that I keep living my life the way God has intended it because that's a way, 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 way better way for me to live. Even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, even when I want to make excuses, I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to work hard and I'm going to stay faithful where God has me planted. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And God, I, I just pray right now, Lord, there are moments and there are seasons where it's tough, where life's a grind, where life's hard. God, sometimes it's difficult to get up the next morning. Lord, sometimes it's difficult to be in that marriage. Sometimes it's difficult to be that parent. Lord, to go back to work and not to work like I feel, not to operate like I feel, but to operate and work and function and be faithful like I should. And I pray for those people that are here today, for those people that are watching online. Lord, that you would re-strengthen them. Man, let there be a new urgency in their life. That they would move and they would work not based on how the situation is that they find themselves in, but how you have commanded us to live. The Lord, we'd work We'd work hard. Lord, we'd live fruitful lives. And we'd be faithful even when it's hard, even when we don't see, man, even when we don't see any progress happening, that we would understand, even though we may not see it, you're still working. Lord, even though we don't feel it, you're still with us working. Let's be faithful. Let us stay coachable. Because the alternative isn't attractive. The alternative doesn't lead to the significance that we desire the most. So Lord, even though our feelings may say one thing, I pray that we would choose to go the other way and that we would live our life according to your word, according to your commandments, and according to your purpose for us. God, let us own the grind. Let's be faithful. Man, let us understand, you're correcting and you're bringing the right instructions to our life so that we can be fruitful no matter what season of life we find ourselves in. It's in Jesus' name I pray.